The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And it is the entirety of the ninth chapter, so you may be seated for this. Our Gospel readings get longer and longer. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Sil Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how now does he see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man... We do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could not do anything. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Surely we are not blind, said the Pharisees. And before Jesus can even answer, all of us think in our minds, No, of course you can't see. You don't see anything figuratively or literally because we have been reading this story and we know that you are the bad guys and the bad guys don't see anything. 
We, on the other hand, like the good guys in the story, we see it all. We see what God is doing in our midst. That is the danger that we have whenever we read this story or a story like it. We're tempted to read the story and divide people into the good guys who see all the things that God is doing and the bad guys who, willfully or otherwise, just don't see what God is doing. The problem is that Jesus doesn't talk about good guys and bad guys in the story. He talks about seeing and enlightenment. The ability to see God's works in yourself, in others, and in the world around you. Jesus talks about seeing as a way of really understanding and appreciating God's works. And that is often tougher than it seems. In fact, there's at least three kinds of people in this story who just don't see God's works. Sometimes that reason that they don't see God's works is because they literally cannot see. The man born blind cannot physically see Jesus, and he can't see anything, therefore, that Jesus does. And also, because he was born blind in his society, he's been relegated to a very small part of society. <coughs> he's been placed in a place where he just has to sit and beg, and he is unable to participate in most aspects of society, and so he is physically kept from seeing and experiencing many of the things that God is doing in the world around him. So he can't physically see. But there are others. Others who can't see because, frankly, they don't want to see. So the parents of the man born blind are brought in, and they're questioned. They say, now, is this your son who you say was born blind? We're thinking maybe here it's not really real. How is it that he now sees? And the parents get all squirrely about it, and they go, well, you know, we know this is our son, and we know that he was born blind, but, but we're not really sure how he now sees, and we don't know who did it, and you know what? Ask him. He's a legal adult. It's all on him right now. And then John adds this little parenthetical remark, and he says, the Jews had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be thrown out of the synagogue, and that's why they answered like this. Now, of course, that hadn't actually happened when Jesus healed the man born blind, but by the time John wrote this gospel down, that was actually happening. And in fact, you've got to remember, it's very important to know this in John's gospel especially, that John was a Jewish Christian, and he was writing to people who mostly were Jewish Christians. And the, the fight, because there is no fight that is more intense and more vicious than an interfamily fight, and amongst people who read this gospel for the first time were Jewish Christians and their Jewish family members who were all locked in this deadly combat, sometimes really deadly combat, about was Jesus the Messiah or not. And the people who believed Jesus was the Messiah said, of course, we're good Jews, we accept God's Messiah, and therefore, you that don't, you're heretics. And the people that didn't accept Jesus as Messiah said, no, 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 he's a false Messiah. If you call him the Messiah, then you're the heretics. And there were fights about not only being thrown out of the synagogue, but being thrown out of the family. It was a big mess. And there were people who went, you know what, I want to stay out of this whole religious debate. I want to stay out of this whole religious fight. I don't want to deal with whatever it is Jesus might have done or not done, because I don't want to see those works. Those are not things that I want to have to decide, is he a sinner or not, as the Pharisees were having this fight. So I don't want to see it. And that's sometimes why people didn't see. And then there were others. There were others who didn't see because they just couldn't figure out how what Jesus was doing fit with their image of who God was and who they were supposed to be as God's people. So, stereotypically, we think about the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees come along and go, well, you know what? He did this on the Sabbath. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. That is one of the key things. It's, you know, it's like for Christians. When Christians go, Do you, did you confess Jesus to be the Son of God? Well, then you're a Christian. Jews would answer that question, do you keep the Sabbath? If you didn't, 
at least in their understanding, then you weren't a Jew. That was the way the Pharisees saw this. This person doesn't live like God wants them to live. He can't possibly be somebody doing the works of God. Doesn't fit the image. Doesn't fit the pattern of who God is or how God would, the kind of person God would act through. But the other group of people that have the same problem are the first disciples. They are the people who started this whole mess. Because Jesus is just walking along, minding his own business, and they go, hey, look, Rabbi, here's a guy who's blind. Now, who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he was born blind? Because that's the way the world works, you know? Everything happens for a reason. You've heard that stuff, right? It must be that everything happens for a reason. So therefore, this guy was born blind because his parents sinned and it's God's curse on the kid or because he himself sinned somehow. There must be some reason for that. And even though Jesus then begun, goes on and says, no, uh, uh that is not the way it works. It is not the fact that everything happens for a reason, but instead what you should be looking for here is how this person's blindness is an opportunity for God's works to be revealed. The disciples, they just scratch their head. They can't figure out how that could possibly be because it's so different from their understanding of who God is, what God does, and, and what the relationship of people to God is supposed to be. And they don't get it either, at least at first. They don't see how this could be. So all three of those groups of people don't see, and the problem of dividing the story into the good guys and the bad guys is that Jesus wants everybody to be able to see the works of God to see the works of God in their own life, in the lives of others, and in the world around them. And the problem is that each one of us, from time to time in our lives, are all three of these groups of people. Because seeing God's works in the world around us, in ourselves, in our neighbors, is harder for us than we're usually willing to admit. And sometimes, the reason that we cannot see God's works in our lives is that we physically just can't see it. Sometimes that's probably not because we actually don't have use of our eyes, but sometimes it's because we are somehow just, or our neighbors, are just so overwhelmed with the darkness and the pain that comes with daily living. Sometimes it's because we're overwhelmed with the chaos and the evil of the world around us. Sometimes the darkness of life so envelops us that, yeah, God could be doing something, but we just can't see it. Even if others say, but look, look at this beautiful thing that God's doing. Sorry, I'm just really having a hard time right now. I can't see it. And at those moments in our lives, Jesus also calls us to have our eyes anointed and washed again in the waters of baptism, and not literally go to the font and do this, but to actually remember God's claim and God's promise on us in baptism. Jesus promises us that even at those moments when our lives seem so dark that we cannot see God's goodness and God's works around us, the reason for that is our own temporary blindness. It's not the fact that those works are not happening. God is actually doing those things. At the Theology on Tap last week, I was talking about Luther's catechism, and he, he has some parts of it that he talks about morning prayer and evening prayer and things like this. And one of the things that Luther always had to do was in the morning, and he clearly was, he was clearly a morning person who wanted to jump out of bed and be all awake and everything. He said, the first thing you should do is make the sign of the cross, saying, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, remembering your baptism. Not, not as a kind of pious act, but as the, rem the reminder at the very first thing you do in your day, God has claimed me. God has called me. God has promised to act in my life. And even if I walk out into the same mess at work that I left the night before, God is doing something in my life, in the lives of others, in the world around me. And even at those moments that I can't see it, I trust that it's actually happening. And it's just my temporary blindness right now. But I'm reminded in baptism that it's happening and that those works really are there.
sometimes for us too. The reason that we can't see God's works is that sometimes we too, but we don't want to see it. There are times in my life and in yours when we probably can sense God's works going on in the world around us, in the lives of others, even in the stirrings of our own hearts. <coughs> the problem is, sometimes those works call us to live and work in ways that are not always easy or comfortable. God may be calling me to live in a way that is really different from the way I'm living right now. To care about my neighbor in a way that I have not cared before. To speak out against an injustice that I would just like to stay out of the middle of. And in those moments in my life, I can really relate to the parents who go, you know, I, would, I got enough mess and misery in my life and I don't need more and I just as soon not see it. And at those times in our lives, Jesus is also calling us not simply to intellectually acknowledge, okay, yes, I guess I, you know, yes, this is my son who was born blind and he now sees, but I don't want to get... Instead, Jesus is calling us to be people who actually live into those words, who live in new ways, who take action, because sometimes the only way to see God's works in the world is to actually live in new ways, to live into those things. That's when our eyes and our hearts and our minds really get opened. Sometimes seeing is more than just opening our eyes. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do. And sometimes for us too, the reason that we don't see God's works is that God's works just do not fit our preconceived notions of how God is supposed to work or who we are supposed to be. Just like those disciples who went, well, the world is supposed to work like this. I mean, God set it up this way. When somehow or other Jesus comes along in our lives and does something different, and it doesn't fit that preconceived notion, sometimes that's the biggest hindrance to seeing what God's doing. On, uh, on Wednesday, when we had our last evening prayer service, Pastor Christine read from a book by Richard Rohr, a devotional book, um, that we've been reading during the, the Wednesday evenings during Lent. He was talking about actually the first commandment, the commandment not to make a graven image. And he said, you know, sometimes we think about graven images as these little, you know, trinkets that we dig up in the Middle East that people put up and they're little statues and people worship them and things like that. But he said, you know, sometimes the images that we worship are the images of our hearts and mind. The images that we create of God, who God's supposed to be. The images of ourselves and who we think we're supposed to be if we're going to be acceptable to God. And sometimes those images are the images that get in our way. So he says, sometimes those are the images that we built in our youth. Images that solidified and energized our own self-image. Those who worship the images, instead of the living reality, simply stop growing spiritually. And I think this is part of what Jesus was calling people to think about in the story. Are we, in fact, worshiping the living God who is real in our lives, or is the image of who God is supposed to be and how God is supposed to work and who we're supposed to be in relation to that, are those images getting in our way? They got in the way of some of the Pharisees, they got in the way of the first disciples. Sometimes they get in our way as well. Jesus opened the eyes of the man born blind so that Jesus could show us that we all need to have our eyes opened to the works of God in our own lives, in the lives of others, and in the world around us. And the first step to having our eyes open is not to assume that we're seeing all that God wants us to see. Instead, Jesus calls us to be aware of how the darkness in life, the resistance to personal change, and even our own images of who God is supposed to be, sometimes get in the way of seeing what God is doing in our life. But Jesus also promises to anoint us with his spirit each day, to wash us again in his baptismal promises, and to call us each day to open our eyes and to live into the new works that God is doing each day in our own lives, 